Hi everyone and welcome on the Upset Media. Uh, it's a special episode today for us and we couldn't be more thrilled with our today's guest. One of the most vocal faces of the EuroLeague. He could have been a baseball player or maybe a Colgate model with such a large, bright and contagious smile. Uh, it's a real pleasure to receive who we uh, could have considered as a rival, but uh, probably most... Uh, um, an example for our podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, is uh, NCAA Hall of Famer, 74th pick of the 87 NBA draft. Uh, Italian Cup winner, Spanish League and Greek League All-Star, Spanish Cup winner and MVP, ACB League champion, Real League champion and top scorer, Sapporo Lake Cup uh, champion and obviously a Real Madrid legend. Ladies and gentlemen, the owner of Crossover Podcasts, Joe Rocas. Woo! How you doing, guys? <laughs> Seven seventy fourth pick or seventy second pick? I'm not sure. I, 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 always, pick. <laughs> I always said seventy second. Maybe I'm giving myself more credit than I need to. Well, maybe we can talk about second pick if you want. That's our pleasure. Even <laughs> there's, there's no such thing as a seventy second pick anymore. Anyways, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, yeah. unusual stuff. All right. Uh, uh, the, the matter so... is that the the draft was pretty loaded uh, back then. Uh, there is a lot of Like current and, uh, NBA players, do you remember all of them? They're like the best NBA um, picks. I I don't remember all of them. I remember I remember some of the guys that I went to camps with, like uh, Cadillac Anderson, Reggie Lewis, Joe Wolf, um, you know Kenny Anderson, Reggie Miller. Uh, who else was there? I can't remember who else. I'm. I, when I got to Hawaii for a pre-draft camp, I hung out with Reggie Miller. Everything else after that was history. Mm -hmm. Billy uh, Billy Donovan. Billy Donovan was in that draft because we also hung out a little bit in Hawaii. And uh, we were we were fighting for the same girl. We were, <laughs> <laughs> we were thinking about a quiz, like it's uh, it's uh, one of the things uh, during your podcast. And we had the first question was about the draft and the players inside. And do you remember David Robinson, Scott Pippen, Kenneth Miss, Horace Grant, and Reggie Miller? That's a lot. Yeah, of I mean, you know, I was actually um, uh, in was in Hawaii. I was in a dunk contest with Scotty in that in that draft. We we actually flew together from because I went to Portsmouth, Virginia, which was a which I was very lucky to get there. Very extremely lucky, by the way, to get there, but. Um, And I had a big game the first night, and uh, I was playing against Joe Wolf, I think, who was the the four guy for North Carolina. And um, the same night, a guy from UNLV named Armin Gilliam decided to drop out of the Hawaii tournament, and uh, and they asked me to go because it was you know it was perfect. I was in the right place at the right time. A four man yeah. drops out, and they needed a four man. So I called my dad and I said, Dad, I said. Um, That, that, you know, I came from a not a we were a very rich family as far as family is concerned, but we were not rich financially. Mm -hmm. I said, Dad, I said, I have an opportunity to go to Hawaii. And and he says, we don't have the money to do that. And I said, no, no, Dad. I said, they're going to pay me. They're going to pay the flight. And 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 they're going to. Of course, my parents knew nothing about, you know, the, the process and neither did I. And um, and at that point, you can't have an agent either. So I didn't I didn't have anybody to, to speak with. And I, and they 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 said no you're going and I said and I said I told my dad and my dad's like no 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 you're not going he's like nothing's for free in life you have to pay and he's like they're not gonna they're, they're gonna they're gonna make me pay I'm like no dad they're not gonna make you pay I'm like don't worry so I fought with him I finally <laughs> went in. and the long story is I sat I sat on the plane with Scotty Pippen to Hawaii for 13 and a half hours and we never even said hello to each other we were right next to each other wow. and because of oh. Because of potential pressure, or just no, because no, he was just ignoring. Because he, was, he was that kind of guy, you know. He's just that kind of personality. He didn't speak with anybody, so mm -hmm. it, was, it was kind of strange. But already, already had the growth spurt, so was looking tall and uh, confident. Yeah, he's very long and very, you know, very lank. I forgot about that until you mentioned, you know, <laughs> in, that, at the, in that draft. Yeah, it was a pretty good draft. I'm, I'm proud to be in it, even though 
I was an afterthought. <laughs> well, uh, still, I mean, uh, being part of NBA draft is uh, accomplishing a dream that everybody is looking for. So whatever number it is, you well, can still say. You know, what's funny is I asked that question to all the guys on my podcast. And and like to me, it, to me, it was never even a dream because I never thought it would exist. So I didn't want to dream about something that I didn't think was a possibility, you know. And um, I was drafted to play baseball when I was younger, but um, my dad wouldn't allow that, which was probably the smartest thing that 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 was the thing that made me realize that dad's actually parents actually know what they're talking about sometimes, you know, and uh, and it worked out for me. But um, but yeah, it wasn't I mean, I'll, I can say it was a dream come true because it happened. Not because it was something I fell asleep every night thinking about, you know. It just, I, I was very lucky. I was in the mm -hmm. right place at the right time. And of course, to be in the right place at the right time, you also have to perform, you know. And that's and I was lucky in, in both of those aspects. I was in the right place at the right time. The right people saw me, and I performed at the right moment. Yeah, well, still a bit of luck sometimes. And I guess well, we we had a question about baseball because we you discussed it with a. Uh, Will Clyburn a long time ago in the podcast? So, uh, Damien, if you want to ask your question, I guess already answered a bit about it. <laughs> yeah, that's the point. But you were sick back then uh, during your, your time in, uh, in college and university, and and you fought to 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 be better, to to get uh, uh, to get in a better shape, and you end up to the draft. So that that's weird. You say that it's not a dream. It was not a dream. It really wasn't a dream because I never thought coming from Niagara University that it was a possibility. You know, I, I I think, you know, I was thinking more of Europe because I had a roommate who whose brother played and coached in Europe. He was a player coach. So I had that possibility in my head, you know, but until I until I, I found that I had a letter, one, you know, one letter here and there from an agent um who ended up being my agent even though that's a great story also in in, in, in Portsmouth but um he ended up being my agent for my entire life until he yeah. passed away and, and, and his, his son and I are still in in contact and um and, and I mean he really took care of me and you know I was again I I continue to say that I believe everybody's lucky in one way or the other some people you know if you're if you're LeBron James if you're Michael Jordan you don't lucky you don't get lucky you just you just made it you know If you're Joe or Lucas, then you have you have to get lucky somewhere along the line to have the right breaks. You already felt the somehow the difference of treatment between uh, different university programs by itself, because as you say, coming from Niagara, maybe there were less expectation, uh, scouting maybe, and all those uh, observations that you could you could get from a different program. There, there, there wasn't less. There was none. <laughs> mm, that, that's even worse than expected. Yeah. yeah. So unfortunately, my, it's... my my second year, my sophomore year, we beat St. John's. It was the first time we had ever beat St. John's, and that was that went somewhat public. I had 20 points in that game, and yeah. And the you know, the funny thing, I can be honest with everybody nowadays. I was out till like six o'clock in the morning the night before that game, <laughs> and, uh, and because we just didn't think there, you know, there's no way we we're gonna win that game, and you know and. I essentially played that game not feeling very well, but uh, <laughs> but I got some publicity out of that. But you know, the, but that was like halfway through my sophomore year. Then there was never any more publicity after that. There was nothing else that followed up. You know, that's like a what what, what we say in the states: your 15 minutes of fame. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. definitely. I enjoyed it for that time, and and then, like I said, the, the lucky part was I, my senior year. I played against a guy named Brian Rousem, who. Um, I think he now coaches in guitar or, or whatever. And he was a projected number one draft pick. And and I went, you know, we never played against, it was North Carolina Wilmington, was, you know, a, a, a good school, but not North Carolina, North Carolina. And, and I went and I I had no idea anybody was going to be there. I just went and with the attitude that I was going to kill him. You know, that was my, my, my instinct was the, this is the only time I'll probably play against the number one draft pick. So I want to kill him. And yeah. um, I, cross I on the schedule. <laughs> yeah. And I did. And uh, and it just so happened that Marty Blake was there. Marty Blake was the head, the head trainer for, or the head scout for the NBA. And that's how I got invited to the tournament in Portsmouth. So that was my my first lucky break of many. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And the third thing is you're the last one drafted from uh, Nigeria. I am. Or no, I, I, am I? 
I read that, yeah. <laughs> I well, assume you know, so, yeah. <laughs> you know it. You know what? It's 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 very possible because I think just a year or two after that they went to um they went to two two rounds only. Yeah. So that that's very possible. Uh, I'm not. I know there was another kid after me, who who said I don't know if he said the scoring record or not. I can't remember his name, but he ended up playing in Greece with me for a little bit, like my last years. He was he was a young guy playing in Greece. I forgot his name now, but but yeah, it's very possible because now there's only two rounds. Yeah. Well, they, they, look another another little uh, another little quote on my on my you know when <laughs> when I pass away and die, I was the last <laughs> the last person drafted from Niagara. That's pretty cool. <laughs> um, obviously, there's a question I wanted to ask you. That's uh, regarding the the whole process nowadays. Uh, before we, you didn't have that option of uh, maybe um, NBL league or CBL. We see a lot of young players trying to go through this program, so maybe even G League Ignite. Uh, would you have wished to have gotten such options like this, and not maybe just NBA or Europe? But to have a diverse options possible. I think the only thing that was available when I was playing was the CBA, it was mm -hmm. the Continental Basketball Association. Yeah. But um, but I, I don't even again because I never because I never thought the NBA was an option. I never thought the CBA was an option either. <laughs> and, and and I think it's kind of like. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I did I did a podcast the other day that's coming out, you know, with Lorenzo Brown, and he's been, you know, on 14 different teams in the last 10 years. And, and you know, six or seven of them are G League teams. And he was telling us about, you know, what it's like to be on a G League team. And, and man, it, you know, I have a lot of respect for those guys that keep that dream alive. Mm -hmm. I, I, but, but, you know, I don't know what else I would have done. I, I, I mean, I honestly don't know what else I would have done because – I wasn't a great student. I, I did graduate as a as a business management with a business management major. Um, but man, that's a, you know that's a great question. I've never I've never been asked that question before. That's pretty good because I didn't have many options other than than here or or in the states. And and I never thought about CBA and mm -hmm. and I never thought I'd make it an MBA. To be honest with you, so it was you know even even when I went to Sacramento, I really didn't think I was going to make it. I went with the attitude that I was I was I was good enough to make it. I never I never doubted myself. I just doubted where I came from and and the exposure that I have over over most other people. But no, I don't know. I don't think I would have had the desire that Lorenzo Brown had, for example, that over you know so many years of going up and down and one game in the NBA, one game in the G League, one game in the D League, MVP. You know, I don't. I I think I would eventually said, man, forget this. I got. I need to. To, to to you know find my life but i look back now and i said that would have been a stupid mistake because you know i was talking to victor clever last night before the game and and i told him like man it's amazing when i think he's like when did you retire i said in 2000 and i said it's amazing to think that i've been retired twice as long as i've ever as i actually played professionally you know, yeah, so, see. so much life, there's so much life after the game but you don't realize that when you're playing it when you're in the middle of it yeah, yeah. There is a lot of pressure. We were kind of lucky because we have a lot of French prospects that are in between. We have Maledon, we have Olivier Sarr, we have uh, Ousmane Dieng and others even in New Zealand. And they they really reflect this, that it can be a day where you are playing kind of trashy game, but still worth it because you are pursuing this lifelong dream. And then in between, and as you said, uh, Lawrence Brown, a huge journeyman, but we don't see enough the the credit that they can get and uh, how comfortable they are right now. But because of the whole work they have been doing, so uh, for sure, it, it was an crazy. interesting interview because then you then you think he came over here and his his first year here he was it was stricken with COVID. His second year here he was on the Russian team. They got you know they got. That he didn't finish the season, so you know you, you tend to think if you learn to run, man, I just have bad luck, you know. <laughs> Black cat somehow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, like it's following me around everywhere, but and you know, and, and when you look at somebody that's been on fourteen teams in ten years as an ex athlete and as what some people would call me a journalist, but I don't consider myself a journalist. I still consider myself an ex athlete. Is you start to think that there's you know locker room problems, there's you know. 
personality problems, issues, and so on and so on. That's your first um, perception. Mm-hmm. But you're not there talking to him. That has nothing to do with that. He's just he's been in, he's been a guy that's been lucky, but it's taken his luck has taken a longer time to to hit than you know most people. Yeah, not coming at first. <laughs> Yeah, just to, to keep uh, a bit in the, during your time in university, uh, you had back then uh, a fucking idol and a coach, coach you, um, Reggie Theus, a former uh, King Players. Um, during these four years, did you have uh, idols, uh, NBA idols, or uh, even uh, European idols player? Julius Irvin, the doctor. The doctor? He was, the only one? Yeah, the do- doctor, Dr. J. He was he was my only idol, and mm-hmm. uh, well, he was my only ba- basketball idol, I should say. Um, okay, but he was really my only my only athletic um, guy that I looked up to. I mean, I, I loved a lot of baseball players that that you know I used to watch. You know, um, I mean, I, I can name names baseball players that you guys would never know, but <laughs> you did uh, hands down, hands down. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, basketball wise, it was Julius Irvin, you know, Dr. J, who played in the ABA for many years, and he went into the NBA back in the seventies or eighties. And um, I don't know. I just, I just, I tried everything I can to be him, you know. And I, I there's, I mean, I was nowhere near the ability that he had, you know. <laughs> but uh, if, if I had to say one thing, I definitely have, I definitely have a better shot than he had. That was the one good thing. But as far as you know, athletic ability and leaping ability, and everything else, and And the reason why I wore my mouthpiece was because of him. You know, a lot of people always talk about that. I was like one of the first ones to wear colorful mouthpieces also. Mm-hmm. You know? And and, um, and I did that, you know, two things. I did the colorful ones because people used to thought, you think I just had this like big over, you know, like fat face. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I started putting colors in so people could see it, you know, not being transparent. But um, I was watching a game one day and, and on TV. And of course, this is a long time ago and, And I was and and I saw him come out of the game and and pull the mouthpiece out. And I'm like, and I looked at my dad. I'm like, Dad, what's that? He's like, Oh, it must be it's like football players where it's you know to protect from concussions and whatever. Mouth guard, yeah. I said, uh, I said, I want one. He's like, and he's like, Are you serious? He's like, Yeah, yeah, I want one, you know. And I went the next day to practice with my mouthpiece in and and uh And I couldn't breathe. I could. I was. I ran up and down twice, two times. And my coach is like, "What's the matter with you?" And you know, I started getting like cuts in my in my in my gums, and um, and I just like, I don't care, man. I'm doing it because because Dr. J did it. You know, Dr. J did it. And my <laughs> coach is like, he's like, you're so. He's like, you can't wear it like that. I took it from the from the bag and I put it in my mouth. You know, you're supposed to melt it. Yeah, in hot water. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> like, <laughs> yeah, and I didn't know that, so I. I wore it the first day of my whole. I mean, I couldn't like eat salt or ketchup or, or anything for like <laughs> for like five days because I cut my I cut all my mouth up. But that was my uh, my my mouthpiece story. So the, what I'm ke- what I keep uh, as a conclusion that uh, Dr. J somehow may owe you a big check of dentist fees or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah, my uh, yeah. It, no, believe me, my father would have taken that mouthpiece out of my mouth in no time if it co- if it cost him more money. <laughs> No, that's a, that amazing amazing story this one i really like it um maybe let's move on because uh no. we have of course plenty of things we'd like to discuss with you um so uh somehow that's uh not a negative aspect but it's a big part of your history you got cut by the kings after nine games uh well there are some uh history parts explaining that bill russell was preferring other players at your position but Um, there's something I really meant to ask you. How did you feel on that moment? Uh, was it easy to proceed? As you explained, that NBA was not a dream, but that ended up kind of shortly. Uh, how much time did it take you? How did they? Uh, how the information came you by? Because nowadays we see a lot of players, uh, such as I don't know, Blake Griffin, talk about it on social media that he got to know that he was traded with a tweet. Uh, So did you get consideration being a rotation player by a call, a note, or something like this, or did you just get to deal with it on the moment? This is one of the craziest weeks of my life, to be honest with you, because there's the cutoff date, which was December 15th. I don't know if it's still that same date now or not. But um, I was playing with a guy named Michael Jackson, who played at Georgetown. He was a, a point guard for Georgetown. And... Uh, 
Georgetown's coach, John Thompson, was best friends with, with Bill Russell. You know, I just watched the Bill Russell uh, Netflix show about how he mm-hmm. fought for racial equality. And, you know, John Thompson was a big, big uh, supporter, obviously, of racial equality in the States and everything. And so they were very close friends. And hey, I was rooming with Mike. And every day, like, you know, bit, uh, John Thompson would call Mike because John Thompson called Bill. And then he would call Mike and explain to you know what Mike needed to do to make the team. So I knew like right there I had a huge disadvantage, you know. But you know we're in two different positions; it's no big deal. And then um, a couple of days before the cutoff date, you know, and I played seventeen games. I only I appeared in nine, but I was there for seventeen. <laughs> yeah, on the on the on the, <laughs> the statue. Sure, sure, that counts. That counts. Yeah, 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 of course it does. <laughs> and so. Uh, one of the one of the veterans, I think his name was Franklin Edwards. I think Frank came up to me, the point guard. He used to play for the Sixers. He, he played with with Dr. J, so I immediately, you know, attached <laughs> focused on him. <laughs> yeah, and he says, uh, he says, "Hey man, he says, uh, go down." He said, "Get injured," and I said, "What?" He says, "Get injured today in practice." I said, "What are you talking about?" He's like, "Like twist your ankle." He's like, "Hurt your back." He's like, "The back is the best one." I said, "What are you talking about?" He's like. He's like, they can't cut you if you're on the IR. If you're on the injured reserve, he's like, they can't cut you. So you'll make it past, you'll, you'll, you'll make it past the 15th, and then you have a guaranteed contract for the rest of the season, no matter what they do. And you know me with my stupid pride that I've had my whole life. I said, I said, what are you crazy? I said, I'm not, I said, you know, if they don't want me, they don't want me. I said, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. And uh he's like, yeah, don't be stupid, man. He's like, just he's like. He's like, it's easy. He's like, just you know, go up, come down on somebody's foot, say you hurt your back. And he's like, they'll never see anything. So I said, no, forget it. So that same practice, I'm, I'm, we're practicing, and Michael Jackson does it. He goes to the basket, gets hit, falls down on the ground. He's like, oh. he starts screaming about his back is hurt. And, and I look, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I'm like, there's no way. <laughs> I'm like, he's actually going to do it, and I didn't do it. And uh, yeah, so they cut me and kept Michael. <laughs> See, it seems unreal. It seems unreal to be honest, because the the way you you're showing it, it means that it was kind of popular to do somehow. Oh yeah, absolutely. It was. It's. it's I mean, I don't know if it was popular, but it was like a you know insider, mm. insider ideas. You know, like this is what you need to do to get over the hump. You know, at least at least you get your money. It was an interesting team, though. There is. It was. It was a mess, you know, and and I feel bad that I've, I, I've, you know, talked a little bit negatively towards towards Coach Russell because of his inability to actually coach. He wasn't a great yeah. coach back when I, at least when I played with him, he wasn't a great coach. But uh, after I saw the Netflix thing, I feel a little bit bad because I never really realized how much how much he meant to so many important things, you know, in America and with. with with racial equality and, 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 you know, racism and everything else. So I kind of take a lot of things that I said back, but you know, one thing is, one thing is your ability to coach a team. The other thing is what you can do to, to make your life so incredibly important. And he obviously did that on and off the court. So big respect for, for coach Russell. And, uh, and then how planning the next step happened? What was your mindset uh, at the time? Did you, um, Uh, with your agent, um, uh, sorry, I forgot his name. Joe uh, Glass. Joe Glass. Yeah, Joe Glass. Uh, how much consideration did you take to go to Europe? Uh, and and did you did he give you options in uh, in NBA? He he was definitely more of a European um, agent. He was geared towards European guys. The guys that he the guys that he, I mean, he had a lot of NBA players. But most of them were, it was embarrassing a little bit because they were big, white, clumsy guys, you know, like John <laughs> Comcack, uh, Greg White, uh, you know, all these big white guys that that could barely move, you know, that would never <laughs> be able to play in the league now, you know. And uh, and um, so I always looked at them like, man, I'm like, am I one of those guys? <laughs> I said, I feel like I'm a little bit more agile than those guys. But um, but no, I had a, the 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 deal was they cut me. And and they wanted me to stick around because they wanted to get rid of Franklin Edwards after that and keep me there. So I waited for a couple of weeks. I think I waited for maybe 10 days or 12 days. 
it was a mess because my girlfriend at the time who was living with me, who was going to be, who was turned into be my my now ex wife. Um, uh, it was just you know we didn't the the ending was was not good for me as a person. Um, <clears throat> uh, she wasn't extremely supportive because of some other things that had happened along the way, so it was difficult and. Um, and then at one time or another, I just, I, you kind of saw the light and you said that, that you know, this is going to be, this is going to be over with. And uh, my agent called me, he's like, how long do you want to stick around? I have an offer in Italy. And I said, let's go. I said, I, you know, I need to make money. You know, that's, mm -hmm. I was, you know, I signed for 125,000. I think I made like uh, 30,000 of it, which was you know, 30,000 for me back then was the most money me or my father have ever seen in our life, you know, which was a lot of money, but so I went over to Europe and I signed, I think, for ninety thousand for the rest of the season, and um, and tried to finish out in Italy. Uh, it must have been difficult to be uh, off the hook on the moment because that's what happens to a lot of players. Still, uh, now they tend to put them in a place in the reserve, but you just got cut. Hard right. thing. At the same time, you have to make your life of a living. So. Must have been difficult. Did in any case uh, origins played with your decision, or did you have time to maybe consider like, oh, okay, I know this place, I have been there, maybe I should uh, have a look around now. I guess too short uh, in terms of time. It, it, you you talk about Europe in general, or yeah, Europe in general. Man, I'm, I tell everybody and every interview I've done, I'm one of them dumb Americans that never learned anything about Europe. If you had asked me where France is. I would have somewhere. <laughs> I mean, I I was one of those guys that thought Spain was down by Puerto Rico, you know, isn't because, it, or by Mexico because they spoke Spanish, <laughs> you know, and um, so I had no idea. I had no idea where I was going. I knew Italy because my mom was was is from Naples, well, not from Naples, but her family's um, Napolitana from mm -hmm. years and years ago. So I knew Italy, and we all knew Italy because we grew up as an Italian family. So there's that boot, you know, that you see on the map. Like, that was the only, in grade school, you know, when you had to do the maps, you know, and, like, name the countries, that was the only one that I could name in Europe. That that and Russia were the only two that we actually knew. So, yeah, I was one of those dumb Americans that um, that don't know where they're going or what they're doing. And when uh, you get that offer from Italy... Um... How are they putting it on the table? Well, that's through your agent, but are you are they giving you some? Um, how can I explain? Like, are they uh, ensuring you role minutes uh, and also in terms of the, of the organization? We have a great parallel with the NBA because we get uh, players such as Evan Fournier or Marco Bellineri that uh, talked about it in uh, Gazzetta dello Sport that uh, you just have to hop off a plane, luggage is accommodation, everything is dealt. But back then, how was it working? And moreover, that's not uh, towards NBA here, it's towards Europe. So how did they get you somehow with money? But are they giving you uh, other incentives or things like this? I mean, it was definitely money. Um, my agent... I believe lied to them and told them that I was seven foot tall <laughs> because when I got off the plane in Rome, they, they wouldn't take me to Caserta. They, they called, they were calling all over the place to put me back on the plane and to send me back home because I was going to substitute Giorgio Gluchkov, who was the Bulgarian guy who was like mm -hmm. seven foot one. And when I got off the plane, they looked at me, they started going crazy. They started, you know, and of course, and I don't know if this is the way it is in, in France, but when, you know, when in Italy, and Spain is kind of like this. So I'm assuming France and other countries are like this. When you have an American person that doesn't understand what you're saying, they yell. You know, they yell like louder. And it's like, no, I can hear you perfectly. I just don't understand what you're saying. <laughs> you know, you don't have, you don't have to yell anymore. And uh, and they finally they brought me they brought me to the to the to the but to Caserta is like a two hour trip from Rome, and uh, and the rest was history. You know, I the, from the minute I got there, I wanted to leave. Um, I, I hated I hated Cassette at that point, not because it's a bad place, but because I just wasn't, you know, personally ready. I went there without, you know, at that point without my girlfriend, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, and I was very alone. I was very homesick. I missed everything about, you know, being being at home. And uh, it was difficult. It was it was one of the most difficult moments of my life. And um but you know when when they brought in another guy after about three months, we won the Italian Cup when I was there, and and uh, we were you know getting to the playoffs and everything, and 
and uh, and yeah, I know how these podcasts work, so I'm probably ask, answering some of the questions that you're going to ask already. That's fine. No, no worries. That's, fine. That's why I apologize if I'm doing that. But uh, just eyes, eyes sparkling, listening to you. So don't worry. <laughs> and uh, and you know they brought in this guy named Tom Chef, Tom Chef, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Um, a big guy to take my place for the playoffs because they felt like they needed a big guy in the, in the center for playoffs. So I was like, you know, I I had guaranteed contracts. I was fine. I wanted to go home. But when I heard the rumors and I knew what was going on, they brought him in for like a trial with me while I was still practicing with the team. So, you know, my my instinct to kill was there still. <laughs> and, you know, so every day in practice, I just killed them. I, just, I destroyed them. And, um, and, I was thinking I would go back to my my hotel room and I would say, man, why am I doing this? Why I want to go home? I'm going to get paid no matter what. But you know that was just my my natural killer instinct was was to be better than that person who's trying to take my place. And um, and they ended up keeping them anyways. And they sent me home in like late April, I think it was or middle of April. So I was there for three or four months, and um, it was a great experience. I got to play with Oscar Oscar Schmidt, Nando Gentile, Enzo Esposito. I mean, it's amazing that I was on that team and I became an offensive player with after you know playing with guys that didn't know anything other than shooting the ball. So <laughs> I learned a lot from the Italians. And and speaking of uh, Schmidt, uh, we read that you were cut uh, basically because of him or because of his ego. I would say. Uh, did you still upset? Uh, I don't know if it's the right word uh, against him or Marcelletti, the the, the coach. I mean, I I don't know if I was cut because of Oscar. I remember there was a game where I scored more than him, and Marcelletti told me that you know, told me looked at the yeah. stats. He told me this is impossible. You know, this, <laughs> you this can't this do that. <laughs> you, know, mm-hmm. he's like, you can't do this. This is not good for me. You know, which I thought was ironic and funny, but. Um, I don't think I was cut by Oscar. Maybe I was I was blind to that fact. Okay. I know he had I know he had the power and the ability to to hire sure. mm-hmm. player players without a doubt because he was God at that place. But um, you know, I, I wasn't I wasn't upset because I wanted to go. I was more concerned about what my future would entail because again, you know, back when I played, there was only two Americans per team. Um, I've been cut from the NBA. I've been cut from my first Italian experience in, in less than four months. And, you know, in, in Europe back then, there was a there was a stigma, you know, between an injured player, you know, back, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, the, the knee operations, a lot of people didn't come back from knee surgeries, you know, the, the same as they did before. And um, so if you got hurt, you're always concerned about how you would come back or how people would perceive you as, as a player. And if you got cut various times, it was the same thing, you know, it's like, Oh shit. Just like we talked about with Lorenzo Brown, you know, when you see somebody that's been one team here for four months, one team here for four months, been released by both teams. um, It's, you know, you start to be concerned about it. And now this, this feeling that I had about, you know, never being a dream to be a NBA player now turned into a dream because I had the taste of it, you know, and, and, and I wanted to get that taste back somehow. And, and, but I just wanted to be paid to play. I didn't care where I was playing, to be honest with you, mm-hmm. because we all want to play in the NBA at one point or another, but I just wanted to, to make sure that I would optimize my 10 to 12 years of, of playing time and, and make as much money as possible and put it away and protect my family. And, and you were, you were performing on uh, in Italy, like 20 points, a uh, few games. You you had time, playing time. So did the, the NBA dream came back differently? I, I mean, you, you want to go back to playing in the uh, in, in NBA, right? I mean, I did. I went to camp that summer. I went to Milwaukee and... Um, and it was... I thought I was going to make the team. I thought I, I thought I played well. And, uh, and, you know, I found out over the summertime that they had signed like 16 different players. They wanted to sign me. They wanted to sign me to be the 16th player. And, uh, you know, of course they come to me to sign a contract and I was excited. I was like, yeah, you know, I'm back in the NBA. My agent called me up. He's like, Hey man, he's like, they only keep 12 guys. So he's like, you may have a, you may have a written agreement with them, but there's nothing certain, you know? And, um, and he called me up with the, uh, 
with the opportunity in 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 Malaga to go play in Malaga. And again, that, my ignorance. I'm like, where's Malaga? Like in Spain? Where's Spain? <laughs> and, you know, and he's like, he's like, they have they have beaches, palm trees, and, and they have palm trees and nude beaches. I said, oh yeah. I, I mean, said, I've never seen a nude beach in my life. I said, sign me up. I'm in. And the um, first day I went to the new beach, I saw this this old lady. I'm not going to tell you her, her where she's from, but <laughs> with like these boobs like down, you know, down to here. And I'm like, oh, the new beaches are not what everybody told me they were supposed to be. I thought, I thought the only people who take their clothes off are, are beautiful people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, back then, being alone that much, who could you rely on? Who were you talking to? You had great relation with your agent, supposedly, but at the same time, on the human side, you said that your girlfriend were was not with you at the moment. And when moments are dark, you are alone in your room and uh, you're in far away from everything, getting homesick. Uh, how could you, let's say, unleash all that uh, nervosity or who could you talk to? My girlfriend didn't stay away for that long, mm -hmm. first of all, so she was there a lot, uh -huh. um, which sometimes made it more difficult, to be honest with you, because you know you 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 tend to um, not only have to be concerned about your professional life and 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 getting you know practicing every day and playing well, but you're also concerned about that person suffering, you know, because they're not at home, they're also you know missing their family, so. And they're more lonesome, you know, than than you are because mm -hmm. they don't have a, they don't have a team, you know, that that they can go to every day and 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 play and and laugh and joke and you know take a a, a trip to Rome or a trip to Bologna, you know, and 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 do that. So um, that makes it doubly difficult, you know. It's it's even harder because then you're dealing with not only your issues, but you have to be sympathetic to their issues also. Mm, so, and maybe being guilty or feeling guiltiness exactly, a little bit. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, I you brought me here, and and you know, uh, you know, it's it's difficult no matter what. But loneliness, loneliness is much more difficult because it's it's because you're alone. I mean, but. You know, there was times where you'd rather be alone also. You know, mm -hmm. you, you say, so if, if I'm going to suffer through this, you know, I'd rather suffer myself than, than to put someone else through it with me also, you know. and um, But we're selfish at times and we, we feel like we're in love and, and we feel like we need that companionship there. And, and, you know, sometimes we get addicted to drama and and instead of just being able to say, you know, let's clean slate, go. Um, I'd rather do this alone because I'm, you know, I'm bringing you down. Also, um, you get addicted to that drama, you know, and and and, and you just at one point or another, you, you either continue living in that drama or you get rid of it. And I decided to continue for, mm -hmm. for whatever reason. I have I have three kids from it, which is kind of good, but <laughs> yeah, you cannot wipe it either. Still, so playing plenty of positive things. Yeah. So, so Damien, time time have... flies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, let's let's jump about uh, to the Real Madrid period. Uh, February nineteen eighty six. You know everything about uh, this uh, exceptional performance uh, against the Virtus. Sixty three huh. points with no threes. Uh, Eleven <laughs> boards, two assists, no, four no, steals. No, no made threes. I but one I... attempted. <laughs> yeah, one attempted. Right. <laughs> And that was at half court at the end of the at the end of the half. I want you to know. <laughs> but but the funny thing is, how did you manage to do it with on one side the assistant coach telling you to pass, and in other side the coach of Adovic uh, telling you to shoot to keep shooting? Who who listens to an assistant coach when Zelko is your head coach? <laughs> At one point, <laughs> <laughs> end of the that's the point. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. You know, it wasn't. It wasn't that he, he was telling me not to shoot. It was, it was just that he was telling me, you know, be careful now that, you know, you scored 31 or 32 points in the first half. They're going to be, you know, they're going to be focused on you. And, and you know, the, the funny part is I could probably remember, I'm sure there's probably more, but I can remember five or six times in my career that I had between 28 and 35 points in the first half. I don't think 32 was my highest ever in the first half. I think I had one game where I had like 35 or 36 at halftime. And um, and after that, I, I you know, sometimes you feel bad, you know, because 
because you're just like, holy shit, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm playing too much, you know, it's, it's, you know, and you try to get other people involved in the game. But um, that night was just different. There was, it was different all around because even the shots that I missed somehow or another, they ended up in my hands, you know, off a deflection or off a rebound, hitting the rim and coming back to me. One of the foul shots I missed came, you know, was tapped to the left. I picked it up and I put it in, I think off the backboard or something. I, I don't even, there's so many of them that, that, that were fortunate, but you know, the one thing I do know that um, first of all, I couldn't have done it without Selko, you know, because he, he allowed me to be in the game for those 40 minutes that I played. Um, and, and I was never a player that, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a, a Michael Jordan. I'm not a LeBron James. I never dribbled the ball. Essentially. I'm more like a, a trade, uh, uh, um, Clay Thompson. Thompson. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that you look at the stats and you look at, oh, he scored 63 points. I probably had the ball in my hand for no more than like 30 seconds of that game. You know, so for you not to have the ball in your hand and be able to score 63 points means you have four other guys on the court at that time that are constantly playing for you, whether they're setting picks, getting you open, um, uh, you know, giving you the ball in the right moment because there's so much of it for me that was – that was important. The most, you know, I learned like most big men did back then. You know, you, you first you learn with no dribbles, then you learn with one dribble, and then you learn with two. And then mm -hmm. once you get to the two dribble stage, you're done. Mm -hmm. so they, they don't expect you to go three, four dribbles. Where nowadays it's, you know, you have to be a dribbler from the beginning. Otherwise, you can't play in this game. Mm, definitely. Uh, you you said that uh, you you think that uh, um, scoring twenty five plus points uh, at the early beginning of the game was something that you were regularly doing. Is it is it a way you were comfortable, or maybe that you were practicing back then to be uh, initiating things or giving that spark of energy directly entering in the game, or it was more maybe natural or coming to uh, the opponent by itself? To me, it was just an instinct to win. You know, that, that's the way I knew how to win back then, you know, and that, and that was the the method. You know, a lot of people, you know, they, they make fun of me on Twitter because I never played defense. You know, Pablo Lasso did a podcast the other day, and I don't know what the <laughs> podcast was, but, you know, he was talking about the fact that I scored 63, but Orlando Woolridge scored 48. That's not true. Orlando Woolridge scored 30, you know. <laughs> and I texted him, and I said, man, I'm still – I'm." Just, I'm still waiting for Orlando Rhodes to, to make up those other 33 points that I scored, you know, but, um, but we couldn't play defense when, you know, Americans couldn't play defense. They could. If they wanted fine. to. I could have played defense all day long and I, and I don't think I would have been a bad defender, but if I would have played defense and scored six points, I would have been back in the States on my bed, you know, looking for a, a, a business management job because the back then we, we were relied on the score 18, 20, 25 points a game. So you either sacrificed for the team or you sacrificed your life. And I decided not to sacrifice my life by playing defense. And 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 I still look and I, you know I still have every now and then like Eddie Tavares now you know he's he, he, with all his block shots he, he's in the top 10 of or he's rising up. I don't know if he's number one or not in the ECB in Spain. And I still see my name on the on the on the 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 top ten of block shots in Spain. So there's you know I had to play some a little bit of defense to be able to block all Definitely. those shots. And 22 years later, still be in the top ten. Definitely. So, which which lead uh, we we had prepared a quiz, but I guess we'll drop it. But I had a very <laughs> quick question about it. Uh, in ACB, do you have more steals or blocks? What do you think? Oh, I gotta have more blocks. You have more steals by about 50. You have uh, 389. You have 315. Sorry, 389 steals and 333 blocks in ACB. So about 50 more. That's what Somebody I meant. Put that on Twitter so I can <laughs> I can send that out to all the people that think I don't defend. <laughs> <laughs> de 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 definitely. Uh, arguably, we we can. I, I honestly consider you as one of the European players that played with the biggest amount of legends, stars, uh, however you want to name it. Um, and it led me to one question. You, of course, you had Arvidas, you had a, your great time with Obradovic. Um, is there a player you haven't been paired with and you wish you would have made an amazing duo, this maybe one-two punch thing, or uh, that guy you were like, oh man, I wish I would have played with you or something like this? God, there is, 
there's probably a bunch of them, but there's one that I can't think of who it is right now. I mean, I got the I had the opportunity to play with Ramon Rivas in in Victoria, which was mm -hmm. um, which you know we kind of after a game or two, you know, we we got to know each other and and um, and I wanted to play with him and I did obviously, but I mean back then it wasn't because I wanted to play with Ramon so much as it was I wanted to you know leave Malaga and get a bigger contract and go to Victoria and make more money. But it just worked out that it was a positive thing. But um, I don't know. You know, I, I think that I was able to adapt to whoever I played with. Normally, my game was able to adapt, whether I had to be more inside, more outside. Um, so I think I would have been fine to play with just about anybody. I didn't want to play with shooters because I wanted to shoot the ball. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> but, you know, I, I was, you know, fortunate enough to play with some really great point guards. And um, and they were able to give me the ball. Pablo Lasso being one of them. Jose Antunes here in in, in Madrid also. Um, uh, Fetty Romero in in Malaga, who's the only guy I ever known that that actually averaged more than forty minutes a game in an entire season because he played every minute, every game, plus all the overtimes. Mm -hmm. um, so I was again, I was I was fortunate to have people not only not only help me succeed but know how to help me succeed because that's important that's the most important thing because i can be successful on my own possibly but never as successful as i was with the help of, of other players and guys like pablo especially i say pablo all the time because i i would say that assist the basket ratio he's probably the point guy that's given me most assist in my career and, uh, and, and, you know, that he knew how to, he knew when to get me the ball, where to get me the ball, how to get me the ball. And, and, you know, a lot of people kind of underestimate that because he knew if I was on the right side and there was a defender near me, where to pass it, you know, he knew which side to pass. And we had that, that chemistry and that eye contact that, um, that, that made us a, a difficult duo, so to speak. So, I think I was fortunate enough to play with a lot of really good players, and, and, and I really didn't ask for anybody else. But it, it's it, it, it was an interesting career to be to, to say the least. Do you have any regrets at, as a player? Uh, we heard you say that uh, playing for Scariolo could have been nice. Uh, do you have any regrets? Um, I don't have regrets because I think I made all the decisions in in based on what I was currently living in. You know, I think that's the only thing you could do in life is is you make your decisions on your current situation. Um, they might turn out to be right decisions. They might turn out to be wrong decisions. But you can't regret those decisions. And, and you just have to live with them. That's why I try to teach my kids. It's like, you know, if you make a decision to move somewhere and live somewhere, it's, it's up to you to make it a positive thing, to make it a good thing. It's not up to everybody around you. And, um, you know, a great, a great uh, example of that, if you, if you want an example is, you know, I could have went to Bologna after my third year here, after I scored the 63 points. The Stockholm team, syndrome. <laughs> uh, the other team in Bologna wanted to sign me. They wanted to sign me the night before, you know, and, and, and they were willing to pay me more than anybody's ever made in Europe. And they were also willing to put the money into a bank account in New York in my name so that the money was guaranteed on a monthly basis for two years. My wife was flown to Bologna to pick out a house, to pick out schools, to do everything. And I was, you know, I did everything but sign the contract. And uh, I didn't sign it. I decided to stay in Madrid. I signed another contract for three years because I love Madrid. So my kids were going to school. They were, you know, my son was learning Spanish. My youngest daughter was speaking Spanish and French because she was going to school with a, a young little French girl. So they would speak to each other. And um, and I thought, like, why am I going to take my family away from this? You know, why am I going to take my kids away from an opportunity like this? And plus, I'm happy in Madrid. I love Madrid. And, uh, you know, I, I decided to sign here. A year later, they got rid of Seuco. They got rid of a bunch of players. They brought in a coach that didn't like me, and I was fired. You know, and I was not only fired, but I was, you know, they tried to, to defame me, you know, and degrade me in a way that was very ugly and very, um, very difficult for me and my family. So 
um, what do I do? I, you know, I made the decision at that point to stay in Madrid for all the right reasons, you know? And and at that point, I didn't need, I, mean, I don't want to say I didn't need the money. We all need the money, but I didn't need that extra bit of money to 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 compensate for the comfort that I had of living in Madrid. And I'm one of those people that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a creature of habit. So once I get into like a, you know, a restaurant, I go to the same restaurant, I order the same food normally because I don't want to be disappointed. So, you know, do I regret that decision now? Yeah, of course I regret it. <laughs> I could have gone to Bologna and made you know, a ton of money, but does it affect me? Does the regret for not doing that affect me? I'm like, no, it doesn't affect me at all because I had no idea what was going to happen. It could have been the best decision of my life to stay here, but it turned out to be the worst. And um, and that's just what happened. So, no, I don't have any regret. Was, you know, I mean, I got to play with Zelko Brodovic. There's a couple other coaches that I would have liked to possibly play for. George Carl was one yep. of those coaches that I would have liked to play for when he was here in Madrid for that year. So I talked to him and um, would have loved to play for George. I think him and I would have got along just well. But, um uh, no nah, regrets. No, I mean the only regret I have, honestly, is 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 not taking care of myself physically as much as I should have. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, when I look back, I should have probably done like more yoga, a little bit more stretching, um, probably eating better than I did because you know I had that mentality that you know I'm tr working out twice a day. I can you can eat, eat what you want. <laughs> yeah. You know, drinking was always an issue for me. I like to go out and party and have a good time. So. You know, if, if there's any regrets, it's it's more personal things than it yeah. is decisions, you know, that I could have done better for myself as a as a as a as a performing athlete, elite athlete, you know, but you don't consider, you know, I don't I don't never consider myself an elite athlete like they say, you know, it's just it's so funny. It's just what I wanted to do. And, and I don't know these guys nowadays if they if they think of themselves that way. I mean, I thought I was incredible. I thought I was the best. Because I didn't know how to play any other way. But I didn't mm -hmm. consider myself this amazing athlete because I never had the body that some of these guys have either <laughs> nowadays. Well, I guess it comes uh, afterwards as well. When you when we talk about legacy, maybe stuff like that, or how the others are telling the story for yourself. I don't, I don't know, maybe. The the way they see you, they you understand afterwards what you've made or how you really impacted the game or whatsoever. I, I, I was with a, a friend of mine who loves basketball. He's not he's he's only been a friend recently. The last mm -hmm. I met him I met actually met him through Fabian and, mm -hmm. and his wife and Lucy. And uh and we've become friends and and my wife was out of town during the finals of the, the Barcelona Madrid last year, ACB. I haven't seen an ACB game in seven years because I do so much Euroleague stuff that I just say in the weekends, I don't want to, I don't want to pay attention. And uh, we go to the game and it was the first time I've ever been actually in public with him, you know, <laughs> and we, and, and we go to the game and, and this guy comes up to me, he says, Oh my God. He's like, can I take a picture with you? And you know, he's waiting outside for, to give the tickets to something. I'm like, Danny, let's go inside. I said, let's go inside, please. He's like, no, no, no. We have to stay out here. I'm like, no, we need to go inside. And all of a sudden, you know, the first picture, the second picture, the, the third picture, <laughs> he's like, oh, that's why you wanted to go inside. I said, yes. <laughs> I said, I don't want to be out here all day taking a thousand pictures, you know? And, uh, and, and, and it's, it's uncomfortable, but it's flattering because I'm 57 now. So I look back, I'm like, all the pictures I didn't take when I was young because I thought I was a superstar, you know, or mm -hmm. God, you know, now I take them because I, I feel blessed, but I try not to get myself into big situations. So one guy comes to me, he says, he says, Oh my God. He's like, Joe, he's like, God. he's like, Mr. Alok, he's like, you, he's like, you've been my idol since I was a kid, like a young kid. I just looked, I says, I said, man, you need to find different <laughs> idols. <laughs> <laughs> having me as an idol and my friend Danny Fab Fabian's friend looked at me he's like that's the funniest thing I've ever heard you actually tell people I'm like yeah I tell people that all the time I'm like I am not an idol to anybody I shouldn't be well trust us we are we are three to have you today we're keeping somehow the poker face but uh, I yeah. understand what, what you're describing <laughs> you, you're giving us the perfect transition because we're going to talk about uh, what you're doing Look, nowadays listen I do these podcasts I know what I'm doing nah, so, <laughs> we uh, know 
com commenting and uh, having a podcast for for the Euroleague. Uh, how did that transition came up? Uh, did the Euroleague came up to you and asked to present something? Did you pitch them something? And uh, you also said lately with uh, Luigi La Monica that you do not enjoy watching game that much. Uh, so <laughs> as, is, as an ex-player, yeah. Yeah, as, as an ex-player, of course. And uh, is this a way to keep being close to uh, the EuroLeague, the whole podcast commenting thing? Man, that's a that's a, a loaded question because there's yes. so many. <laughs> it's like a big tree with a ton of different branches, you know. I, yeah. Again, again, I was I was extremely lucky. You know, I I, I first broke in the EuroLeague when when the games were here in Madrid, the final four was here in Madrid. And I start, actually started with one team, which is their, their C CRS um, corporate responsibility. And, uh, and it's something that I love doing, love working with, you know, underprivileged kids, unfortunate kids that, that don't, that don't have the, the life that, that I've been able to have mm -hmm. trying to give back a little bit. And that was, um, that was my point where I was trying to do everything I could with Euroleague, try to get in the door uh, a little bit. Uh, I did some Spanish broadcasting here in in in, in uh, Television One. It's called in the national television, and that went okay. But um, yeah, then Johnny Rogers, who was working with Euroleague, uh, decided to move back to California to. Because he was a scout, also a year, uh, I think, for the Clippers at that point, or 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 maybe for Oklahoma City, I'm not sure. And uh, and he told Frank Lawler, who's the head of the media department, that um, that he should he should give me an opportunity. Now, the funny thing about that is Johnny Rogers was cut from Sacramento for me, and and you know he came up to my room and I thought he was going to try to kick my ass, you know. <laughs> 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 and he put his hand out, shook my hand, and he congratulated me. So, you know, Johnny's a, a guy that I love him to death. Um he's he's he showed he showed me from an early age what it is to be a man, to be a professional, you know, to accept whatever comes to you. And uh and then for him, you know, years later, of course, you know, we've had, you know, I played against him when he was in Madrid and you know, I knew his his ex wife, and he knew mine, and and you know we hung out a little bit, so we became friends over the years. But for him still to recommend me to to do this um, was was a great thing because it's not a typical thing, and I don't know about in Europe, but in Spain, it's like you know once you once you have a cliche and you're in a, a group of people, you know, working together, no one wants to bring anybody in from outside that group, no matter how much you know you can better your product or not. Um, they don't want to take any chances. The European mentality is let's not try something new. Let's keep it, you know, let's keep it the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, but no, and then from there, you know, I did recommend the podcast. I recommended a podcast that was more of a weekly, a weekly show. Um, but they wanted something more what we call evergreen. They wanted something that people can go back and listen to, you know, two years later, three years later. Um, so, you know, I, I succumbed to what they wanted to do. Um, it was it was difficult at first because number one it wasn't what I wanted to do. Number two it was like it was difficult to to form to get some sort of form on, on the the questionnaires, and then you try not to make it identical also, which is hard to do because once you get into these things, you know they become it's the same podcast for me. It's not like you guys talking to me as you know you you're not going to talk to me the same as you would talk to you know Papa Lu Papa Lucas. Mm -hmm. you know, a whole different story for me. It's like it's their story and I have to kind of give that that chronological order of their life but um but it's great I, you know I, I, I've been again I continue to say the same thing over and over again you guys might laugh at it, but it's luck a lot of it's so much luck but you know it's it's being in the right place at the right time and and having people that count on you and having people that help you and uh and then it's up to you you know it's up to you to to do the good job and and I think I'm I think I'm doing that I'm not I'm not the greatest commentator for games. I don't like to do it, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd rather do the the analyzing of the games, but it is more exciting because when you get a play like Costello the other night, I might have the number one player of the year, you know, by the, by the end of the mm -hmm. season. So, so you know, you know, my voice will be there. My, my voice will be there all year long. <laughs> 
And speaking of uh, commentating and podca podcasting, what is your uh, everyday routine like? How do you prepare yourself to do uh, you guys, a game and a podcast? You guys have been trying to get in touch with me for six months. You you, you don't know what my everyday routine is like. <laughs> a year. A year. <laughs> is it a year? <laughs> is it a year? The, the Classico was like in February last year. I mean, I have to tell you guys a funny story that you're going to laugh. This... You guys, you got back in touch with me after I did this Greek one, yeah, the Greek, the Greek interview, and, and 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 so I don't pay attention to a lot of things. I just kind of like I have so much going on because I have a gym also that that you yeah. know that we, that we, we're trying to like just survive, you know, in the gym, you know, every day, every month is a survival thing, and uh, and when the Greek guys got in touch with me, they got in touch with me through Instagram. I swear it was you. <laughs> I swear it was you guys. And so I'm like, okay, I'm finally going to do the interview with you guys. And finally, I felt so bad. And, and, and I, I, I get onto the link, right up until the interview, I get onto the link and I open it up and I see these guys start to talk Greek to each other. I'm like, I'm like who is this? <laughs> I'm doing the podcast with. <laughs> So you can expect maybe some uh, invitation from Italian people, Lithuanian people. That's not us. Definitely not us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, it, I can't remember the name of them. But what's the What's your name on the Instagram? They, uh, Media. Yeah, Upset Media. Upset Media, and they're they're some sort of podcast, whatever. And I thought it was a, I thought it was you guys. For sure. <laughs> and my wife just like, oh my god, you're terrible. But I'm usually pretty good about those things. But when people ask me to do things, I don't. I don't, I don't know. I just, I lose it. I guess I got two basketball teams that I coach. I have the gym. I have the podcast. I have the games. And I guess my daily routine, as I was telling you before, the, this week was pretty easy because I did like the, the you know, Basconia, Valencia, and, and, and Madrid as they entertain and play with each other. Um, but, you know, my daily routine is just, you mentioned the fact that I don't like to watch games. I like to watch games to study. Mm -hmm. Um I don't like to go to games because I just, I don't, you know, number one, if it's a blowout, if it's a, you know, a 30 point victory, uh, that's not enjoyable for me. You know, I want to see a, a game like we've seen the last two nights with Madrid. Um, number two is, is you're analyzing the game constantly as an ex player, you know, you're constantly analyzing what, what they're doing, what they're doing, right. What they're doing wrong. And I find myself, Um, being more critical than I am, you know, supportive. So it, 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 you know, after a while, it gets to be difficult. When I when I went to this game that I was telling you about with this Danny guy, mm -hmm. you know, is by the third quarter, I think Madrid was winning by 12. and I was exhausted. I was just like, he's like, he's like, you are right. I said, I said, I said no. I said I think I'm going to go to the bar and have a drink. He's like, why don't, I said, why don't you meet me? I said, why don't you meet me when the game's over and uh, and we'll have dinner. He's like, you're going to leave the game now? And I said, well, not right now because I don't want to leave now because it's the middle of the third quarter. And it was the, it was the middle of the, third, the end of the third quarter. And he ran up and went to the bathroom. He's like, give me two seconds. I got to run and go to the bathroom before the, the quarter starts. And I wanted to go to dinner. And uh, he's like, no, I'm not going to dinner. I'm like, dude, I'm like, they're winning by 15 points. The game's over. Barcelona, they look terrible. I said, so he's like, you're not going to stay? I'm like, no. So I left and I went to the restaurant and waited for him. <laughs> But, must be, must be pretty difficult to be uh, yeah as you said um, critic and at the same time trying to still enjoy uh, what you've been uh, living your whole life. No, so, but what, but when I put when I put the headphones on and I commentate, it's a whole different thing. You know, I don't mm -hmm. now now I'm analyzing for the public. You know, so so I'm actually um, able to express my opinions, able to express what's happening on on the on the ground on the floor, and that's. That's what excites me the most is being able to give some sort of analytical. That's why I'm not I, I'm not in favor of of doing play by play. I like doing play by play. It's it's more exciting. I get to talk more, and as you guys can see right here with this interview, that I like to talk. Period. Um, but uh, but no, it, it's 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 something I love to do. Um, I love when it's game night, you know, and, and even when it's I put those headphones on, I still get that little bit of nervous feeling in the stomach. And and I think if, you know, in life, if you're not a little nervous before you do something and, and you don't have the passion to do it, then there's really no need. There's really no need to be trying to do it just to just to make money. 
do you have any uh person you haven't interviewed yet and you wish to have on your podcast because sometimes we have those period of time when one uh goes uh, uh goes on and then we have three weeks without anything and I'm, and personally i'm like damn who might he be interviewing right now who is he going to get <laughs> And we get uh, GMs, we get players, we get the referee, they're all amazing, interesting story. But is there one that you are hunting for right now? I mean, obviously, we want to do Vizankov because of the season he's having. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big thing for us. But, you know, you have to understand, you guys, you know, I'm, I'm working through EuroLeague. And so, you know, we're very concerned about audience. We're very concerned about you know, clicks and, and all that, the the business side of of what is a podcast, you know, and, and how often it's seen and, and how many downloads and how many listens yeah. and so on and so on. That's always important. So it has a lot to do with who we also interview. You know, I mean it's it's you know I I, I spoke with Marcus Howard, for example, uh, the other day when I was in Basconia and it was the day of his birthday, he scored zero points in the game, you know, yeah. and, and And they, and they won by 39 or something. And uh, and, you know, I, I talked to my guy, like, man, he's just a good guy, you know, the way he talks, blah, blah, blah. Like, but, you know, Basconi doesn't have a lot of English-speaking people, you know, number one. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, you know, it's, it's just not it, – you're not going to get a big fan base interviewing somebody like that, even though, you know, for me it would be enjoyable – But mm -hmm. the bottom line is the business also, you know. So when we do this, we try to we try to keep that in mind also. You know, we try to keep the fact that we want people to be able to listen to us since it is all in English. Um it's a little bit harder in Spain, for example. Like, you know, some of the, the Real Madrid interviews I've done haven't had as much, you know, downloads because you know, not too many people a lot of people speak English here, but they can't they won't sit down for an hour and listen to it, you know, an hour, hour and 20 minutes, unless they have something you know, tied into it, you know, if mm -hmm. you're a real Madrid fan and you speak good English, you're going to want to listen to what Pablo Lasso had to say or, or, or Walter Tavares or Fabian, you know, for that matter, or Yabas, Yabaselli was a great interview, you know, yeah. I mean, it, he was great. And I still haven't gotten that shirt from him, but you know, he keeps Yeah, really? I was, <laughs> I was about to ask you. <laughs> I still haven't gotten that. I was like, I'm like, man, would you stop being French and just give me what's, what you, what you owe me? <laughs> he just laughed at me but um so a lot of it yeah i mean there's a lot of people i'd love to do you know and, and i really enjoyed luigi la monica i thought it was it was eye-opening for That's me it was mm -hmm. because i never i never realized so many things that referees have to go to and now when i'm commentating the games and they make a bad call luigi's made me feel bad about you know calling them out for a bad call but uh but it was great i mean the, the whole part about you know them knowing what the situation is at the end of the game, you know, and yeah, especially this you know, part, yeah. to foul, where to call the foul so that they don't get into trouble was to me, it was fascinating. It was so eye opening. So, and that's one of the things I tell everybody, I, you know, in every interview I do, I learn something new. And, and a lot of times I learn even a lot of things new. Chavi Pascual to me, just opened my eyes with a lot of different things. You know, the coaches are really the coach. I, I get super nervous before I do coaches. I can control players, but I get super nervous before I do coaches. <laughs> because I don't, you know, I know they know a lot more about basketball than I do. So <laughs> it's like, you know, you're trying to you're trying to show you that you know just as much as them. But some of them coaches are so damn smart, and you know, they they they've forgotten more about basketball than I know. <laughs> so let's continue. I don't know if you have time left, but yeah, I'm good. Uh, I'm good. Let's... I'm good. I've, I've opened up my calendar for you guys, so we're good. Thanks a lot. <laughs> yeah. Let's go about uh, talking about uh, your uh, current season. Uh, what has been your biggest uh, surprise, upset, uh, satisfaction since uh, October? Man, it's just, it's been, and I don't think there's any one thing you can pick out this season. There's so much. To, to 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 talk about this season has been incredible the the yeah. parity with within teams you know the the thing that I because we study so much and because I watch um, so much um exterior games you know which I mean you know when when I sit down and study things I'm studying teams um trending you know the trends of the teams whatever you see so many teams like 
Valencia is a great example because it's the most recent one for me. You know, my my memory doesn't last more than a couple of days <laughs> these days. At fifty seven, that's a, a lot of times I send messages to people. I'm like, hey, you know, we need to do this. I'm like, I'm only sending you this message because I won't remember tomorrow. <laughs> but um, but Valencia, for example, who between I believe it was round eighteen and round twenty two won five games in a row, and yep. they dominated. Not only were they won them, but they dominated. You know, and with a lot of injuries. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, boom! You know, they're gone. They 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 start going down again. Um, Basconia, who on December 29th, I remember that because the next I drove back home from Basconia that night to go on a New Year's trip with my wife to Santo Domingo, my new wife and my Spanish wife, not my ex. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you know, they they took over first place on December 29th in, yeah. in the Euro League. And since then, you know, up until this week, they were three and eight, I think, from from that point on. And uh, so it's been that type of, of of league, but it's been that type of league in so many different ways. And Adul Efes, for example, they go on a roll, they get back into it, and now they're injured and they go back down again. So, you know, it's – well, two teams are making a run, two teams are dropping. Then all of a sudden, the other day, they drop and they, you know – and you got about six teams that are just kind of like going up and down. It's like you know the you know tug of war where they have you know you have the rope and you have like six teams on one side of the rope and six teams on the other, and you have that flag in the middle and you it's like it's coming, it's coming to the end, and then it goes the other way. So it's it's amazing, it really is. And and you know so many people get upset with me and 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 you know they'll, they'll send me nasty messages about the fact that I say that this is so much more of a better product than the NBA is and I know when the NBA gets to the playoffs and it's the finals <laughs> man, <laughs> it's really not much better basketball in the world than that when they really get intense I mean the talent is amazing but this on a nightly basis on a weekly basis is just absolutely amazing it's it's and I'm not saying it because I work for it I would say the same thing if I wasn't working for your league and I wasn't part of your league it's it's just the intensity is, is amazing. The fact that, you know, Elba Berlin one night in last place can go out and beat, you know, Barcelona mm-hmm. or Olympiacos, you know. I mean, Olympiacos lost by 20 the other day. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's it. I, I, I forgot who they lost to. I, think, I don't know if it was Milan or... Milan, yeah. Uh, yeah, lost by 20, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and to me, Olympiacos is the number one team in, in the league by far. And the way they play and their ability to 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 play in big games. So I don't know. I mean, there's not one thing that I could call out that that makes it more special than, than anything else. Just the fact that there's such a traffic jam in the middle of the pack, you know, between four and and thirteen or fourteen. I mean, last night in week twenty seven, there's not one team that was able to clinch a playoff spot. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. It's never been like that. You know, we had. We had a debate uh, not that long ago, actually, discussing how uh, how was this year league season so far for us, and we agreed to say that maybe not the best of all time because it's extremely difficult to track back, but definitely one of the most, if not the most intense, because yeah. one win can actually move everything. We were talking about Serena Zvezda not long time ago, uh, considering that they are done, and actually we have two wins in a row, and everything comes back. Milan is coming back, and they're getting it's closer to Maccabi. It's it's just amazing what's happening. Yeah, and then, and then you start, you know, because for the games, I have to look at the schedules, and, and you start looking at the schedules, you know, I mean, Monaco plays Basconia tonight in, in, in Victoria. You you look at the fact that Maccabi and Basconia play next week in, in mm-hmm. Tel Aviv. Uh, you know, Milan, like you said, Milan is out of nowhere starting to play incredible basketball, and, and they're not far away. It may be a little bit too late, but you know, it depends on whatever what everybody else does. But there's so much interchanging, and and you know, right now it's a lot of people say you lose two games and you go down. You lose, you win two games, you go up. It's not really like that because you have seven, eight teams fighting for the same place. So if you win two games, maybe three other teams lost two games also. You know. So you see, Basconia, for example, Basconia was what, until they beat Madrid was three and. I think they were three and eight or three and nine in in the new year, but they've only got but they've hung out in that sixth and seventh place for like the last four weeks, even though they've lost. 
And and now they're trying to go, you know, now they're trying to secure that spot a little bit. So it's it's just amazing to watch. And if you focus on on each of those teams that are between fifth place and and thirteenth place, it's an amazing little um, battle within a battle. You know, we have a lot of um, we had a lot of movements last summer because of the situation with Russia, and we had plenty of teams that kind of made them market with. Um, and we also had a lot of rookie players coming into the EuroLeague. We can quote a lot of them. We have a lot in Basconia, for example. Is there one that really uh, amazes you so far? I know that uh, uh, we are a pretty big fan of uh, Dalton Holmes and Darius Thompson from Basconia. But is there one that really caught your attention? And Oh, man, he's bad. This one, he's real bad. Well, I, I, I think Marcus Howard caught my attention more than anything because he's electrifying the way he played. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the way he started the season, you know, knocking down threes. And now he's kind of, I mean, I don't want to say he revamped his game, but he became a player that now he's trying to get to the basket a little bit more. But, you know, you see guys that, that you know, it's tough in this league to to score on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. because, you know, coaches, scouting, you defend it differently. Yeah, you, know, you put more helps on other people. So it's normal that Marcus Howard's production has gone down a little bit as the season wears on. But um, you know, I, I love home. I love um, I love him. I, I just I, I just think he's he's a player. He's been inconsistent because I don't think he's found his role yet in in, in the in the team. Um, but that's that's changing. But uh, you know, the last couple of games, Darius Thompson has been absolutely ridiculous. I mean You know, and then young guys like Porchita, you know, that I just think is is as a baller. I mean, he's just got he has that 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 thing, man, that just you know that makes him makes him a great player, and it's going to make him a great player. But you know, I, Marcus Howard is a guy I think that I would I would I would be the first person that pops up to my head because of his his ability to fascinate people. I mean, he's he's. He's essentially he's Shane Larkin and Mike James, you know, kind of combined mm -hmm. between the two of them. You know, he has the ability to get to the basket. He has the ability to shoot the three from deep at all times. And and um, but uh, man, Darius Thompson is just you know what I love about Darius Thompson is he he's just clean. he just shuts the hell up. He doesn't say anything, man. I saw him in the last couple of games get beat up every time he goes to the basket. And you never see him complain about a foul. You never see him talk to the referee. He's just kind of like within himself. And 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 I think that um, that says a lot about a player because it's hard in this league to not not bitch and complain because there's a lot of contact in the Euroleague, man, that, that isn't called. And uh, and again, going back to the fact that what we talked about with La Monica, you know, the, it's not so much the, the 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 bad calls that referees make. It's the it's the calls that they don't make. That you know, the block that that Hamas had the other day on Tavares right at the basket, and you know, to to help his team win the game. How easy would it have been for a referee just to blow the whistle and call that foul? Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, just, and instinctively just blow the whistle, and and even if he blows the whistle and says, "Oh, it was a mistake," you break the rhythm of that game, and it changes the whole game. So you just forget about the importance of 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 you know the referees making that call, but. Again, Darius Thompson, he's not affected by any of that. And he just keeps balling out. I, I love watching him. But, so, yeah, I mean, Basconia always brings these new guys in. You know, they always do this on a yearly basis and, and they perform well. So, any, whenever you ask me about rookies, I always look at Basconia first. But there's a lot of guys around that are good players. And Ho Howard is actually lucky to have Thompson that is uh, more Same. leading than the, than the beginning, having this uh, incredible. Uh, Uh, assist to turnover ratio because he last game 18 and 14 with one turnover is great it's amazing and somehow Howard is not getting the blame because he played seven minutes he's defending more now there's more scouting on him and we are not talking about it that's also a show of a great team and great collective that after all uh, the star is having troubles for a few games nobody talks about it because others are caring that's what makes it interesting Yeah, you know the, the teams are attacking Marcus Howard a lot more. Also, they're 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 making they're they're finding the mismatches and they're putting the bigger guys on him, and they're attacking them offensively. Because you've seen a lot of games lately. I think in 
in in Italy, he, you know, he played, he scored 10 points in the third quarter, but I mean, he was on the bench for most of the time with three fouls. Um, so they're, you know, they're, you know, you, the, the best way to, the best way to stop an offensive player is to make him play defense, you know, but, you know, they used to say that about me too, but since everybody said I didn't play defense, I didn't have to. So they couldn't stop me on the defensive side. <laughs> Uh, um, now let, let's talk about just the, the playoff race. Uh, so we have Olympiacos, Real, uh, um, Fenerbahce, and Barcelona. Then, what's your uh, opinion on the, the four next Monaco, Basconia, and, and, and then give me your pronostic? I mean, I think Monaco is going to be there for sure. Um, the big game tonight for both of these teams, you know, uh, that's going to be a big game. And I might even spend my, since I, since I, I'm in my, my monthly, like no drinking, no being, no wine, no, no alcohol, no nothing, you know, eating good. I might stay home on a Friday night and watch a, a EuroLeague. <laughs> um, but you know, it's so hard. I, I think Valencia has built themselves a big hole that, that, that you know, in these last four losses that they're going to, it's going to be tough to get out of that. Um, Zelgiris has made that comeback after they got, you know, they won the Lithuanian Cup and got blown out by Real Madrid and by Barcelona, but they won, they won both games in this double week. So they're, they're still hanging around. Um, Maccabi, Maccabi is just, an, I mean, you look at that roster from, from, top to bottom and you say man how how do they lose you know they with Wade Baldwin with Lorenzo Brown with you know they have these all these these and same thing with Fenerbahce Fenerbahce you say how do these teams lose sometimes you know Motley playing the way Motley plays they have they have um uh oh god why can't I think of his name right now Wilbekin there's Scotty Wilbekin out there you know he's been he was hurt for a while but now he's back so I, I gotta think Basconia is going to go through. Um, There's Partizan as well. Partizan, Partizan ooh, I don't know. I mean, they're there. They're there. I think with Zelko's experience, they have a chance. They lost a big game last night, which mm -hmm. I felt like they needed to win. They got they got lucky on Tuesday night also because they were losing most of that game from what I remember. Um, yeah, Partizan... Partizan I think Partizan's going to... You want me to place them too? Partizan's going to be eighth. Mm -hmm. uh, Maccabi seventh. Okay, it's interesting. Only a sixth. Fenerbahce fifth. Okay. Ah, and, Monaco, and Monaco takes the fourth spot. Monaco fourth. Real Madrid third. Barcelona second mm -hmm. and Olympiacos first. Mm -hmm. okay. I hope you got that tape. I hope you write that down. <laughs> definitely, definitely. We'll be remind. We'll be reminding you the last. I think. <laughs> I think the top four are going to come out correctly. The mm -hmm. bottom four, they might be there, but they might be a little bit different because of because of tiebreakers. But you have to think, Madrid loses a tiebreaker with Olympiacos and Barcelona. Mm -hmm. They win with Monaco. So okay. they we'll beat be reminding you. lost here by one and they beat Monaco, I think, by six, no, in in, in Monaco. So they win that tiebreaker. Yeah. yeah. So, we will be reminding you. So about uh steals and blocks on Twitter and when the Euroleague regular <laughs> season yeah. is done. That's we'll, important. That's even more important. <laughs> we'll we'll do. And promise. I want you guys to put in there like who said our Laukas didn't defend? <laughs> no. We we'll promise. <laughs> our Laukas or our Lucas, I don't care. Depends in, in caps. In, in caps. We we'll, we'll you know, do that. With, with with Twitter now and with Facebook and with Instagram, you can send like our Laukas to Greece and the Lithuania, you can send our Laukas <laughs> to the Europe. <laughs> Our Lucas to America, you know, you can do those bots, you know, and and and, and get your demographic down. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have um, uh, well, plenty of questions remaining. But I, hey, I don't have... give me, don't give me that Euroleague quiz because I'm terrible at it. No, no, I, no I, actually, <laughs> actually, uh, we we meant to, but uh, or, uh, we'll, we'll move on. I promise. Right. Um, we have we have that uh, that inside conversation that we had that we uh, we are talking about uh, shushu players, which means favorite, uh, the one we get a lot of affection from. Uh, th there are a few of uh, 
Well, you can see Damien has an amazing Monaco jersey signed by one of, if not the leader of the shoot yeah. team, which is John Brown uh, the third. We're, we're looking for some players like color, blue color, or maybe not the, the star of the team. Do you have some guys like that? We we got an amazing game from uh, John Di Bartolomeo with uh, yeah. Maccabi Tel Aviv. Is, is there one or maybe a few players like that that you have a great affect for? Yeah, you know, I think... Um... I think, uh, you know, when people ask me questions like that, there always seems to be one person that pops into my head and then I try to think of other ones. But I think I have to go with Matias Lasor, the way he, yeah. the way he's uh, interacted with the fans in Belgrade and, and the way, you know, every time they win a game, you know, he's out there, you know, jumping around with the fans. And, and uh, so I think, uh, I think he would be the, the guy that, because my biggest thing, And I was lucky personally that I, you know, it, it was the way I played more than anything else. But for some reason, the, I was, a, the fans were attracted to me because when I played, I, I tried to involve the fans into the game. They, they, they motivated me. They made me a better player. And I always tried to appreciate that, you know, the big basket, you know, you look up to the fans or whatever. So I never did what the sword's doing. I never got into the middle of a crowd and, you know, jumped around and danced like he does, you know what I mean? But uh, but I think just my presence on the court was able to, and to this day, you know, when people come up and say, you're my idol and so forth and so on, I really, I mean, I laugh about it. I make that that funny comment, but it really means a lot to me. And, um, and you see a guy like that, you know, enjoying his time here in Europe, you know, and, and, and man, this is just the, You know, it's such a fortunate thing to be able to do to play basketball at this level, to be play, to play basketball with with these fans, and and you know, I love to watch people enjoy it. I I I, I hate to, you know, there was a point of my career where I let my fame and my popularity uh, get away with me, and and not be as close to people that I should have been. Uh, so when I see guys that that open up to public open it up to the people open it up to the fans and, and today it's not easy to do man because you get killed on instagram one day to the <laughs> next one bad game or one good game and it's hard to keep your your anonymity these days you know because you're always out in the public eye but you know i regret like you said you asked me about the regret thing i regret the way i treated a lot of people back when you know when i when i was at my highest level And when you see guys like this that, you know, that treat everybody like they're his brother or his sister is, is really cool. So that that would be the guy that I would say is is Matias Lasor that I enjoy watching after a game. If they win. Yeah. And, and he again, went to uh, Matias, uh, to the fan, uh, fan's wedding. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, that's crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. Right? <laughs> in, in costume, assisting to to wedding like that, and again, we're talking about a journeyman as well that moved a lot, uh, hey, uh, exactly. had good years in Monaco, but went on and on again. And uh, great, yeah, great. The fact that that you know, you say you, if you if you're able to find a home, it's going to make you a better player in the in the long run because you're you're comfort with you're you're comfortable with all your surroundings and everybody around you. You know, the players come and go, coaches come and go, but if you can find a home. You know, I thought that was the key to my career was I was able to stay in. I told Lorenzo Brown, I said, you know, I said the, the greatest feeling in the world wasn't scoring, you know, points, wasn't winning games. The greatest feeling in the world, were, you know, that were the years that I was able to pack my summer clothes, go back to the States and leave my clothes here and come back to the same house and the same team. And that's, like, cool. mm -hmm. that's such a comfortable feeling as a player because you know where you're going and And again, I told you guys earlier, I'm a creature of habit and I love to to keep things, you know, kind of status quo. So uh, that was good for me. I mean, other players, you know, other players like to go from one team to another and and, and they find they find their knit somehow or another and do it. I can never do that. Yeah, last, last two things. Uh, as we're French, let's do like French style. Imagine you book uh, a, a table for five, you included, Uh, who do you pick uh, in the basketball world to have a nice, a nice evening and a nice bottle with? But sharing a nice bottle of wine, maybe croquetas de jamón if you are in Madrid or something <laughs> like that. No, we, no, we can go French. That's okay. <laughs> uh, let me see. Giselle Bunchen? 
Uh, I'll do I, my wife's my wife's in the other rooms. I can't do all four girls, right? Mm, so yeah, let's, let's stick basketball player or coaches. Basketball or, talking only. Ah, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Um, and Giselle was just a joke, you know. My wife loves her. <laughs> <laughs> let's go. So, <laughs> if, I, if I if I invited Giselle, I'd have to invite my wife, which would not be any fun for me. <laughs> um, only in basketball. Or, uh, well, or... it can be it can be a GM, an agent. Uh, maybe you are inviting La Monica to share a good uh, good bottle of wine. Um, four people, four people or five? Me and four. Oh, four or five, anyway. Uh doesn't matter. Uh, Table is yours, so up to you. <laughs> I mean, because of the after party, Selko is always invited. You know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Obradovich will always be there because we'll do a bottle of whiskey after the after the dinner. Um, he's one. Julia Serving, obviously. Dr. J, who of course. I, I met in London and was intimidated and didn't take a picture with him. So I'd, have, I'd like to come back and take that picture again. <laughs> um, I don't know. Off the court, I'm not sure. But, you know, Michael Jordan would have to be there. Because, because to me, he's the greatest player of all time, you know, without a doubt. And it's hard to say that because I was a Julius Irving fan, but <laughs> MJ would MJ would have to be there. Um, let me get one or two more. Oof. I have, I, I have a strong feeling that uh, Bill Russell and maybe Oscar, Oscar Schmidt are not coming uh, to the, to this table. <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately, Bill's not with us anymore, but even if he was, I don't think he'd be invited. <laughs> <laughs> That's because he doesn't like French food. It's not because I don't no, know. No, okay, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to regret when I hang up with you guys, I'm going to regret not saying somebody that I'll remember later on, but um, well, I'll, you can I'll, you, I'll you send can you write us. Yeah, I'll send you my Instagram. Uh, let me think. One or two more. Uh, yeah, I don't know if a lot of you guys would know Coach K. Yeah. Coach K, do of course, yeah. I don't know if a lot of listeners would know who Coach K is. I think. Um, I think he'd be a guy to, to that would be cool to sit down with and, and, and talk and and I'll go I'll go off the table, off the basketball world, and I'll go into the acting world and I and I'll say Bill Murray. No, oh, all right, good, yeah. a good a good pick. Yeah, yeah he, 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 I mean he's the guy that I always the, when everybody asks like if you went on like a, a like a twenty four hour uh, car ride or you know. Mm -hmm trip who who would you want to be in the car with and bill murray is the one guy i always say that you know so of course i'd have to invite him for, for dinner i just <laughs> he knows much more about golf than he does about basketball but my wife was amazed i was in a, a tournament in greece that i'm an ambassador for and he was there he was invited to the tournament and my wife was like you're like a little kid he's like you're like all these people that come up to you <laughs> like in restaurants and in games and and in concerts and like and they bug you and you're like oh my god this guy's gonna bug me this guy he's just like you're the same way with Bill Murray he's like you won't leave him alone and I said I've loved this guy since I was like 12 years old you know I mean he was a part of my life since I was 12 from Stripes and Caddyshack and all those those incredible movies when I was a kid so yeah he'd have to be at the table too but I'll let you guys know if I remember somebody else Sure. Remember, sure. this is this is the case that my wife sees this. This is basketball and everything else. She's not invited. Yeah, no, we're gonna right. get, we're gonna cut to the part of uh, with, uh, just a bunch of. I mean, I'd, be... I'd, I'd have to invite Sabonis too, just so that he I can have someone else to hang out with with Selko after the after dinner. A stronger a stronger bodyguard to protect you in case you're... <laughs> it could be good. <laughs> yeah. And uh, believe me, Savas is a bodyguard. I, I've had to carry him out of a few places. Believe it or not, he's not easy to carry. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine. Uh, well, I guess you're pretty warmed up now. That's that's going to be our last question. Uh, five of all time. Uh, you can include yourself definitely, but uh, and you can pick uh, all time players, active players, up to you. But give us your roster. My, my the 
the your, best. Your five of all time, including my starting you, five you. of all time. Yeah, mm -hmm. starting five all time. Could be uh, ten if you. If yeah, you want. This is so hard. This is so hard because you you can't take you can never take magic out of the point guard spot. That's that's number one. Um, and you know, because you you look at guys like Steve Nash, you know, and 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 guys that were just absolutely amazing point guards. You know, the, uh, Jason Kidd, um, John Stockton. But the problem was magic was magic. So, you know, magic has to be the point guard. Um, there's one position I'm going to struggle at. Uh, but Michael's definitely my two. Yeah. He's, he's going to have to be my two. Well, there's actually two positions I'm going to struggle at. My <laughs> first one is, is, is the three spot. Uh, you know, and it's definitely between Kobe and, and, Le and LeBron. Um, so many bad things were talked about, you know, Kobe over the years when, you know, when he had some personal issues and so forth and so on. When I got to meet him in Dubai and I got to hang out with him a little bit, you realize not only that he was an amazing person and, and but I mean, his talent was, was amazing. And, and I don't know, I, I, it's not, it's not because I don't like LeBron. I just don't like the way he went about things. So I'm going with Kobe as my three. Um. Oh man, I'm gonna tell you what my four man is gonna be. My four man is gonna be, and this is out of the ordinary, but I'm gonna put him at the four. And I'm going old school here. Let's go, uh, uh, Akeem. Most people wow. will put him at the five, but I'm putting him at the four. Why well, enough mobility for him to be play to be playing for, I guess. Exactly. I exactly. I mean now nowadays, nowadays, you know, he wouldn't be a good four because he can't open up the floor. But um at my five, check this out, just to finish off the interview. <laughs> Bill, Bill Russell. Nice. Has to be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Uh, I gotta go with Big Bill for at, at the five spot. So that'd be my that'd be my starting five. I guess it it, it might win uh, a few games against Alba Berlin or even yeah. the Olympiacos. <laughs> you should, you we, should get a few things. <laughs> we might be between like we might be between that sixth and fourteenth spot in the Euro League right now. Train to clinch. <laughs> hey man, we hey, most of those guys are so old. It's probably true. <laughs> Well, they mean. Do you have any other questions? Hey, you, no. you know, you know, you know, you're old when two of your top five are not are, are not living anymore. That's that's yeah. That, yeah, yeah. Mm, uh, the little sad part, Bali. Yeah. No, I think we're good. Like, thank you a lot. Thank you a lot. It means a lot of for us for our podcast. Maybe you have an advice for us uh, to finish the <laughs> the interview. An advice to keep going, finding players to interview, to finding coaches. Uh, talking about European basketball in France. How 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 can I give you advice? I had I had you guys waiting for a full year. To do this. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to it's hard to nail people down, you know. And and, and to be really honest with you, um, people say they're busy, but they're not really that busy. Mm -hmm. You know, they choose to be and. and Yeah, they choose to be, and 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 I, you know, I, I'm gonna admit I'm in that category also. You know, I'm, I'm I'm fortunate enough to have a lot of free time in my life, but when I do have free time, I like to enjoy the free time the way I like to do, enjoy it. You know, and uh, and it's been nice to actually reminisce a little bit, kind of turn the table, and you guys ask the questions and me answer. So um, I, I regret the fact that we didn't do this before. <laughs> we you made know, it. We'll go back to the regret question. I regret that we didn't do this before, but I'm really happy that we did it now. And, and you know, everything everything comes in due time. As far as like finding other people, good luck. It's not the easiest thing <laughs> in the world to do. 
There's a, well, we, a lot of people blocking the blocking the way now. The queue. <laughs> well, we we'll yeah. promise you that this time we won't wait maybe another year to to get you back or to to invite you again to discuss something else. On a personal note, I I have to thank you a lot because um, I'm translating things on uh, on Twitter for our French uh, community, and uh, I've been translating all your uh, podcast episodes. Really? I uh, took care of the one of Dante Exum lately. Will Kleiber, La Monica is not done yet, but going to be very soon. So I thank you because you make me work somehow <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I get to, I get to interact with Gershon when you made the episode last year he answered me because I made that huge thread translating everything in French so uh, it meant it meant a lot to me of course to to have this moment with you and I really appreciate it okay, thank you very much and I apologize about the year wait but no no it's, a, it's about us but last no long, worries. as long as it was worth it that's all that matters yeah, next one will be in Berlin. That's our goal, our main goal for this year. <laughs> the next uh, current rally. We will be in Berlin to see you and have a drink uh, with you. In Berlin? When's that? 2024, the final four. <laughs> next it's year. 2025. I was going to say it's Kaunas this year. Yeah, yeah Kaunas this year, but next year. We're too small take, now. It takes him a year. Yeah, we, we're oh, too, too small, small now, now to be okay. in Kaunas. But oh, next... Hopefully, hopefully I'll be there. This is the most final fours I've made in my career. So it's been a lot easier. <laughs> it's been a lot easier with the headphones on than it was with the with basketball <laughs> shoes on. Uh, Guys, it, I really it, appreciate it. Thanks so much. Y'all have a it great was amazing. Thanks thank to you. you for your time. Given Thanks and to uh, hope to hope to get you very soon again to discuss about anytime, anytime I'll be I'll be willing to help. Our pleasure. Thanks a lot. Bye, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye.